it should be good. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's let's get let's get started um, with the uh, presentation um, for the sake of time. So Bismillah, we'll begin in the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful. Uh, thank to everybody for uh, being here. Uh, again, you could have been anywhere uh, tonight, but we appreciate you being here for another series, uh, another session of our series Inside Islam uh, before we uh, go into Ramadan. And we have a really special uh, session today with a really special guest, a good friend, um, student minister Robert Muhammad uh, of the Nation of Islam, Muhammad Mosque uh, 64, I believe. And yes, sir. yeah, and and inside Islam, in and of itself, the series we've we've uh, put together at Muslim Space, uh, we've designed it uh, as a regular series um, for the purpose of focusing on uh, diverse communities of beliefs and. Uh, peoples within Islam um, and these conversations, these sessions that we have uh, center the community, center these stories, center these peoples who oftentimes are spoken for on spoken behalf of um, without their own perspective being given. So uh, we want to be able to center these voices. We want to be able to uh, give uh, the, the proper um, space for us to not only learn um, from the communities and, and the scholars and the, po the folks who are actually in these communities, but also as a chance to interact with, have a conversation with, and be able to engage with. Um, and so uh, these conversations, as I mentioned, the session, inshallah, will have uh, Brother Robert be able to uh, do a uh, presentation, share a little bit about um, the Nation of Islam, Islam. Uh, a little bit about uh, his uh, and if you are unmuted, just requesting that you mute uh, the presentation. Um, and uh, just as as mentioned as well, he'll tell us a little bit about the Nation of Islam. He'll tell us as, as well about uh, the work that's being done here in Austin um, and maybe how uh, we can get to uh, not only get involved, but get, a little, get to know uh, the community a little bit more here. So uh, without further ado, as I mentioned, we'll have uh, the, the presentation and the session. Exactly. Right. Uh, question and answer. So uh, we'll be able to interact with uh, Brother Robert and have those uh, conversations with him. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to Student Minister Robert Muhammad. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you and learning from you. And again, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate um, you giving us the opportunity to share our experience and, and share our sojourn here um, in the United States of America as a Muslim brother who accepted Islam a little over 30 years ago. Uh, we're thankful to uh, Almighty God, Allah. And we're grateful for another time, another pocket of time that has been given to us by Almighty God, Allah, to um, rededicate ourselves through the holy month of Ramadan, um, through our recitation of the Holy Quran, our prayers, um, and our abstaining uh, from, you know, the worldly things that we see and we participate in on a daily basis. And so we thank you once again. I, I know that when you were connected with the University of Texas and when Trump was uh, elected, um, you held a great forum there at the University of Texas and you invited us to participate. And so we are uh, forever indebted to you for giving uh, us, members of the Nation of Islam, an opportunity to share our experience um, here um, studying uh, Islam and um, doing our best to be Muslims here in the United States of America. And so we're grateful for that. And we want to just um, as quickly as we can to go through some of this information uh, here this evening and then, uh, as you said, we're open for, for questions at the, um, at the end. Now, hopefully, you know, you gotta forgive me, brother, because uh, my, 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 my tech savvy is, is not as keen as others. So we're gonna try to share this screen here. Um, and hopefully it will work. So can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, uh, let me get my. So we just kind of wanted to share, I have some notes here that, you know, we, we kind of wanted to share 
uh, this evening just to uh, help us walk through the notes. But it's, it's very important for us to understand at this particular juncture in time, going into the holy month of Ramadan, uh, the unity of the Muslim world. And as a member of the Nation of Islam, uh, and the, uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has long uh, fought for and has in, imposed on us the uh, activity of uniting with the Muslim world, particularly in this particular time period where we know that Islam has long been under attack. And so I just wanted to share that if you don't know that as followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we in fact adhere to the Holy Quran. Um, the Holy Quran says, I, Allah, am the seer, a book which uh, we have revealed to thee that thou mayest bring forth men by their Lord's permission from darkness into light to the way of the mighty, the praised one. And as you know, if you know anything about the United States of America and black people in our history in the United States of America, through systematic oppression, of course, the transatlantic slave trade, Jim Crow and systematic oppression, that much information has been kept, uh, much light has been kept away from the masses of African-American or black people in the United States of America. But what Islam has done for us what the adherence to the Holy Quran has done for us. It has brought light to our community and it has helped us as men and women evolve out of the dark shadows of existence. And so the question is, why did God reveal Quran? Why did he reveal it to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Um, and through Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, what was the purpose for putting a message directly in the mouth of a man fulfilling what was written in the Torah and the gospel? That whosoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Not a man getting a vision. Prophet Muhammad was not a man uh, receiving or having a dream at night, but he was a man that was hearing God speak directly in his ear and he was an unlearned man who would repeat what he was being told and what he heard in his ear. And it would be written down. And from the majestic writing, a new world would come into existence, a word that was so powerful that in, it would affect every discipline in human endeavor. And every human being that was touched was affected by that word, so much so that the European scholars have to admit that when they want to talk about the most powerful and influential human being of the last 6,000 years, they say without a doubt that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from of Arabia is the greatest man that uh, ever walked among human beings because his message affected the lives, transformed the lives of more people than Jesus touched and than Moses and all of the pro prophets, you know, in fact. And so um, he didn't do it simply by speaking. He didn't do it simply by uh, a caste system. He didn't do it by being a part of a royal family. He didn't do it by doing these other things that we see that are being done to make people great. He did it with a book called the Holy Quran. This book is so great that Allah says to the disbelievers, he says to the disbelievers this, and if you are in doubt as to that which we have revealed to our servant, then produce, in one uh, section it says produce uh, another one, in another section it says produce a chapter, and then in another section it says produce a verse like it, then of course we know that the disbelievers could not produce it. The Holy Quran goes on to say this, oh man, we have not revealed the Quran to see to thee that thou mayest be unsuccessful, but it is a reminder to him who fears a revelation from him who created the earth and the high heavens. Prophet Muhammad has been successful in transforming the society of his day 
and removing poverty from among the people and setting up systems, not just any kind of system, but systems of education, systems of government, systems of law, systems of science, systems of agriculture, culture, and religion. And these systems allowed the people, the Muslims, it allowed them to rule the world for centuries, starting with the people who were, as we are taught in history, were totally illiterate. In fact, he was called the Umi prophet, right? The prophet who would come to a people who were steeped in ignorance or did not know aspects of, of wisdom. But under the prophet's guidance, those people became rulers of the world. How could a people come from total ignorance to become the light of science, mathematics, law, religion, culture, and rule the world if God was not with that man and with that message that lifted those people from ignominy. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, many of you may or may not know, but he was given 114 books to read. 113 of those books were on aspects of the life of Muhammad. Well, why was he given 114 books, but 113 of those books were given to him on aspects of the life of Muhammad. Because as Muhammad would establish Islam 1400 years ago among a people that were described as steeped in ignorance, so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's task, and he was charged with establishing Islam in the hearts and minds of those that had been oppressed for over 400 years in the United States of America, and he would have to brush up against aspects of the prophet's life. He would have to endure similar trials that the prophet had to endure, and he would have to go through aspects of growth and development to establish it among another group of ignorant people, another group of people that have been reduced to the rubble uh, of a society through the transatlantic slave trade. And so he had to study the prophet in order for him to become and to be successful with establishing Islam in the hearts and minds of the people that he would go to and that he would begin to work with in Black Bottom, Detroit, and Chicago, and all over the United States of America. And so the question that we are asked is, how is it that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and how can you compare his work, uh, the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Some of these things are really, really simple, and, and they are really, really, uh, uh, they're in front of us as we live and as we speak. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, when we look at prophecy, whether we be looking at the Torah, whether we're looking at the gospel, or whether we're looking at the Holy Quran, every time a prophet was raised up to represent a message to the people, that prophet was raised up out of the people in which that message was to go to them. And we're often reminded that in the Holy Quran that Allah says that every nation will receive a message or a messenger. And we know through the history of the transatlantic slave trade and black people or African-American people in the United States of America, we had yet to receive, although there were Muslims in the country, although there were Christians and great evangelists in the country, although there were those of the, uh, the uh, Judaism and and, and, and adhere to the law of Moses, none of the work that was being done through theological thought, uh, through ideological uh, work, none of it that was being done was able to have an effect on black men and women in the United States of America until the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was taught a specific, he was given a specific delivery system and a specific method followed by a regimen to introduce Islam to black people in the United States of America. And through that process, 
the work that he did was so great among a people who were deemed no people at all that it was recorded in Reader's Digest that one scholar said that this mild looking man, talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is the most powerful black man in America. He offers a new way of life. Muhammad prompts even his severest critics to agree when he says he attacks traditional reasons the Negro race is weak. The great author James Baldwin, in his book, The Fire Next Time, he says Elijah Muhammad has been able to do what generations of welfare workers and committees and resolutions and reports and housing projects and playgrounds have failed to do. He goes on to say he has done all of these things which our Christian church has spectacularly failed to do. He's speaking about in the black community. In the New York Times, another researcher and scholar says, alone of all the Negro leaders, Elijah Muhammad has a vivid awareness of the vital need of a new birth in any drastic human transformation. And he alone mastered the technique of staging a new identity. It is worth remembering that what Elijah Muhammad is doing to the Negro is in a sense what America has done to the immigrant of Europe. Former presidential assistant and former Harvard professor in Esquire magazine wrote Muhammad's movement is unique in that it has thrived outside of the Christian tradition and the Protestant community. White America, uh, white Americans have brought this on themselves and the responsibility can't be evaded by attacking the Muslims. In Jet Magazine, uh, one researcher writes, Muhammad, a master psychologist, offers identification, definition, and belonging to all of those who seek it and in return gets a loyalty, obedience, and discipline which staggers the imagination. Cosmopolitan Magazine, uh, it was written, and it said that Muhammad gives the followers, gives his followers that ineffable sense of being, sense of power that binds them together. Now, these are individuals that are looking at what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught using the wisdom that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and using a delivery system to get up next to black men and women in America and measuring it against the productivity of those black men and women of America. Do you know that we are in the age of uh, private school and school choice? And you hear the politicians, particularly here in Texas, talking about school vouchers. Well, it was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the early followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that pioneered the private school movement, the charter school movement, and all of these school choice movements because it was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that told his followers to take their children out of the public school system and because they were being programmed a certain kind of way. But in order for us to survive and thrive and be productive, we would have to be taught by ourselves and not those under a sis systemic uh or on a system of oppressive information that was being given. And guess what the United States government's response was that they charged the Muslims with con contributing to a, the delinquency of minors. And some of the early followers were arrested and given pr prison sentences in the federal prison. But because of that sacrifice, because of that sacrifice in 2024, we can talk about school vouchers. We can talk about private schools. We can talk about charter schools. And so the world of education and the citizenship of the United States of America owe a debt of gratitude to the early followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because it was those believers that, con that began the process. They went to prison. that began the process of opening the doors for people to have choice of where they wanted to send their children to school. And 
through the efforts of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaching and uniting black people all over the country in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, and the 70s, and leaving his principal student, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, to continue the work Islam spread like a wildfire in the United States of America. In fact, most of the black men and women or African-American men and women who profess to be of the Islamic faith, they, they may be, um, uh, uh, quote unquote, a part of the Orthodox community, but at that foundation, black people got their introduction to Islam through the Nation of Islam and under the tutelage of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's development and his programming, we produce restaurants all over the country. We produce ballrooms in some of these restaurants, snack shops. We were, um, prior to his departure, mid uh, 1970s, we were working on a hospital. We had a Temple Number no. 2 clothing store. We had Muslim bakeries all over the country. We had uh, supermarkets and grocery stores uh, in various cities around the country. We had the number one fish import business in the country. The Nation of Islam did. Larger than any other fish import company in the country. We had a bank in Chicago called the Nation's Bank. We had uh, clothing factories where we made and we produced our own stylish garments that were modest. Um, we had a Muslim import store. And because of the early sacrifices of the Muslims taking their children out of the public school system, we began a school system called Muhammad University of Islam all over the country. We began to use our, uh, our business acumen and we uh, established business like clothing, like cleaners and transportation and logistic companies. And we raised livestock and we had slaughterhouses and uh, we produced eggs and poultry. Uh, we got into agriculture and agribusiness and we grew, uh, we grew fruits and vegetables and transported them all over the country. And of course, the Muslims are known for being out in the community with the newspaper then was Muhammad Speaks, now the Final Call newspaper. We had our own beef packing plant, our own lamb packing plant. And so these are just some of the accomplishments. We began to go into the uh, housing industry and real estate, and uh, we did a lot of farming. These are things that poor Black people who were not developed and nobody had given the time of day the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that we should do for self or suffer the consequences. And he talked to us about pooling our resources, uniting our pennies, nickels, dimes, our quarters and our dollars and living beneath our means so that we could save money. And when we would save money because he, he, he moved us away from drinking, he moved us away from smoking, he moved us away from drugging. He moved us away from a lot of the vices that we were using to um, hide the pain of oppression that we were experiencing um, here as the son and daughters of slaves. And we utilized that money to, to uh, establish these businesses, to establish the banks and the clothing companies and the logistic uh, businesses and whatnot. So the United, so the Nation of Islam is known for its economic blueprint as well. But above all of that, the work that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did wasn't with our pocketbooks. It wasn't with, <laughs> excuse me, it it wasn't with our uh, our social existence. It was with the hearts and the minds. And so when you developed the relationship with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his teaching, and you studied and you developed and you dedicated yourself, you will see individuals fulfilling scripture when, it, when it's talking about Jesus. How does this man have not having letters is learned? 
we know the history of Brother Malcolm, Brother Malcolm X. And although he was incarcerated for a few years and it is recorded that he read the dictionary and over and over, but it wasn't the dictionary that made him the scholarly uh, giant that he was. It was his dedication to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Although he quit school in the eighth grade, but because he studied what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave to his followers from the Holy Quran, from the information that he was fed, he was able to go and confound scholars in Harvard and Yale because of the wisdom of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We all, many of us know about the greatness of his son, Wallace D. Muhammad or Imam Waterthuddin Muhammad and his scholarship and his exegesis of the Holy Quran was uh, world renowned and he was respected as a scholar who was able to hoist a Muslim community on his shoulders through the might of his scholarship that at the base of his scholarship, although he disagreed with some of the aspects of the teachings of his father, but at the base of the Islam that he learned, he learned it from his teacher, who was also his father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Holy Quran talks about man being made and shaped and fashioned out of sounding black clay or sounding clay. We all know of the greatness of a man who was formerly known as Cassius Clay, who was brash, who was boastful, but he didn't become the champion of the world um, and the humanitarian champion that he became and uh, losing his title for refusing to go overseas and fight uh, in a war that would not bring uh, justice to his suffering people here in the United States of America. But that man, Muhammad Ali, became a humanitarian's humanitarian because of his study and his dedication to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that at the base was the revelation of the Holy Quran. And of course, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, a man who didn't finish college, who at the height of his popularity in the United States of America, he called on black men to come to Washington, D.C. for a moment in a day of atonement in 1995, October 16th. And he, although he called for one million, I was I'm grateful to Almighty God a lot. I was old enough and I was present at that time period. And it was announced while we were on the mall that it was over 1 million, reaching 1.5 million. And by the end of it, it was announced nearly 2 million men were on that mall because of the call, not of simply a minister, not a bishop, not a father from among the cloth, but a Muslim, a black Muslim who would have been sold in the same, whose ancestors were sold on that same mall. He was able to make a call to black men and nearly 2 million showed up on a Monday morning for us to atone to almighty God, Allah, for our shortcomings to ourselves, to our families and to our communities. And to this day, prior to that, there hadn't been a gathering that reached those numbers. And to this day, there hadn't been a gathering of that magnitude. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what he taught and the example that he gave to the Muslims helped black men and women to evolve out of the dark shadows of existence and take off the inferior mind and put on a mind of Almighty God, Allah, and our responsibility is to strive to, <laughs> excuse me, is to strive to be pleasing to Almighty God, Allah, by becoming good Muslims and striving to be reflections of Almighty God, Allah, through the study and through the development of ourselves and our community. And I'll close this section with this. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, 
and the opening of the self-improvement study guides entitled the basis uh, self-improvement the basis for community development in a lecture that he did in phoenix arizona in one particular part he says it is not enough that we grow horizontally through the acquisition of farms factories banks industry trade commerce money and good homes why because horizontal growth alone is death all dead things are on a horizontal level. Therefore, we must grow vertically, grow in uprightness, and we will be, or we will be overcome by our horizontal growth. And the Honorable Lewis Farr can also mention in that letter, he said that the city of Phoenix, and, and I'm not quoting, is beautiful and they are consistently building new structures and new buildings and the city was being beautified. But he asked the question, what good does it do to beautify the cities when the soul of man and woman, if not beautified, if not advanced, if not grown or developed, will destroy the beauty of the buildings that are built in that society. So our commitment is to grow and to develop vertically and not simply horizontal horizontally. Thank you again, my brother, for the opportunity to just come on and share. And we pray to Almighty God, Allah, that we are successful in this year's holy month of Ramadan and that, um, you know, it's pleasing to Almighty God, Allah, uh, from all of those that believe. And so, uh, but let me greet you all as I I don't think I opened up in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I bear witness that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is indeed his messenger. I greet all of you again in our nation's greeting words of peace. As-salam alaykum. I like it so awesome. Well, as salam Jazakallah khair. Again, appreciate that, uh, Brother Robert. And, uh, you know, so much for just uh, an insight and a look into uh the the nation's history and 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 you know just uh the the lived experience you know not only uh where uh things have started where things went but where things are going how things continue to go and uh, i'm hoping in this uh next portion that we've got the next yes, kind of or be a little bit uh interactive uh we can have a chance to um you know have some, field some questions from folks in the audience um and also just kind of have a chance to learn a little bit more uh about the nation here so yes, uh yeah, let's uh let's go ahead and uh jump in there here. Um if you want uh are you gonna, you want to keep your screen up uh, or do you want to uh yeah, you no, want so let, let me stop sharing. You're good. All right. Good deal. Um so yeah, so let, let's go ahead and uh, I, know, I know a couple few questions have come in and so again for folks uh if you do have them, you can drop them in the chat or you can message them directly to uh the Muslim Space uh uh participant and I'll I'll, I'll get them uh, in the order that they come in so as they're coming in um, we'll, we'll address them. But uh, first off, just uh, curious if you're able to give us a little bit, um, you, get, you, you let us into a little bit of the history uh, around uh, the nation of Islam, especially as it uh, went both in parallel to uh, stemming from the history of uh, of Islam with respect to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, the mission of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and some of the parallels with respect to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit just for folks uh, to be able to place this in the context of uh, our history, of American history, uh, time period wise. You know, we we know a little bit about uh, maybe the nation of Islam uh, in, a, in in when it gets amalgamated with uh, the the civil rights movement, or you know, a little bit beforehand. I'm wondering if you could place us a little bit um, time wise uh, for when the nation of Islam, when when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, began to preach this message or began to form the community. If you can give us a little bit of that historical um, timeline to mention, not, not necessarily maybe, I won't put you on a spot for like, hey, yes, here's, sir. A, here's a day, here's a day, but just to give us a little bit of context there. Yes, sir. The Nation of Islam was established um, in July 1930. Um, the founder of the Nation of Islam, of course, is Father Muhammad, who um, taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, like all of us, joined the Nation of Islam, and he began to teach in the 30s, um, and he began to develop the program that we see today. And as his star grew, 
he attracted individuals uh, from the 30s to the 40s and uh, in the 50s, some of the great ones began to come like Brother Malcolm and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the 60s, uh, Muhammad Ali, and of course, uh, his son, uh, Imam Waratuddin, Muhammad, um, but the great establishment um, alongside of the civil rights movement, many people um, saw us in opposition to the civil rights movement. And if you know, when you study anything about that time period, we were labeled as, um, uh, the civil rights movement was labeled as anti-violence and the Muslims were labeled as violent. Although, if, although none of our events were, uh, no violence broke out during any of our events because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad established safety and security through the FOI, which is the, uh, the male uh, military wing of the Nation of Islam. And so we don't carry weapons and we don't allow people to carry weapons into our meetings and into our facilities. And so we have what is called a check procedure. And so we never saw um, violence, the same type of violence that you would see during some of the civil rights movements. And in fact, I heard somebody say here recently that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was more violent than the nation and Brother Malcolm and that whole movement because everywhere he went, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., violence broke out, but wherever we were, violence, uh, we kept the violence or the would-be violence in check. And that's partially because we were taught to defend ourselves and that the Holy Quran gave us a mandate to defend ourselves. Uh, and so when people knew that we would defend ourselves, any thought of violence would be curtailed by well-trained men and women who were willing to give their lives uh, to see their people free and to fight for Islam. And so um, here in the city of Austin, I don't know if you wanted me to share some of the local um, establishment of the Nation of Islam. Yeah, but, please, please do. But here in the city of Austin, during the height of the growth and development of the Nation of Islam, um, there was a mosque established here back in the 60s and 70s, Muhammad Mosque or Muhammad's Temple at that time, 64. And excuse me, as we know, um, under COINTELPRO and the work under um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, there was an attack on many of our organizations in the Nation of Islam was one. And so prior to the departure of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, there was work being done by the United States government to topple um, the Nation of Islam and even change the ideology of the nation of Islam. And so the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan began to rebuild the Nation of Islam um, fr from 77. Uh, he began in 77 all the way up to 1981 to reestablish the Nation of Islam. And so here in the city of Austin, after the temple was no longer existent in the late 70s, um, we finally got a start um, after the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan came and spoke at Bass Hall in 1992 um, and on the University of Texas campus, we started a study group here in the city and it was based on the uh, visit of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and that gave us the inspiration, that gave us the motivation and that gave us uh, the momentum that we needed to begin to study um, the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad here in the city of Austin. Um, and over the years, my brother, we've been able to establish and we work in various programs. We have uh, a couple and some of the believers that have established a, um, a, a um, 10,000 fearless first responders program where uh, they teach disaster preparedness. Um, they teach you how to survive in the wilderness. They teach you how to do search and disaster and many other things. Um, we have a sister here with an organization in our mosque 
that focuses on family and the development of family um, in the community, uh, that focuses also on male-female relationships, uh, single uh, singles, and, and how to properly um, engage in activity with the, among singles, the, the, the Muslim way, and it, the way it was prescribed by the Holy Quran and the mandate of the Holy Quran. We also have um, the training of our men. We have uh, brothers and sisters among us that have uh, established uh, major martial art programs, security programs in our nation. Uh, we've established uh, here recently after the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March conflict resolution programs here in the city. Um, we have uh, we had established um, after COVID, we have to rebuild some aspects of what we've done as a mosque, but we've had Saturday schools for our children so that they will be taught and reprogrammed from going to the public schools. They will be retaught and taught the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Holy Quran, um, and all of the facets of the nation of Islam. And we've seen the fruits of that over the years. Um, we we have met, you know several believers that study uh, the Holy Quran and the Arabic of the Holy Quran and have provided Arabic classes over the years for our children and have offered it for the adults here in the city of Austin. And there's much, much more that we could talk about and that we could discuss um, as it relates to what we have, uh, uh, Allah has blessed us to offer um, to the community here in the city of Austin. Sure, Jazakallah khair. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, quick question as well, kind of a follow up to that. And and I, I think this was a one that just came in here uh, with respect to the practices of the Nation of Islam or uh, Muslims who are part of the Nation of Islam. If somebody was to uh, go uh, to visit, you know, the Nation of Islam, visit the mosque, um, the question comes up about. Uh, does the faith life practice or the faith practice of uh, the Nation of Islam and members of the Nation of Islam mirror that of people uh, or Muslims in, uh, you know, kind of like the, the majority kind of understanding of like mainstream Islam in terms of praying five times a day in terms of the Juma prayers on Friday? Uh, you mentioned Saturday school for kids there. Um, what What is that kind of like? Uh, daily life to look like, faith practice life look like for uh, the nation and members of the Nation of Islam? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, taught the believers how to pray. He taught us the times of prayer. He taught us ablution. He taught us the purpose of prayer. And he taught us not only um, how to perform a dua, but also how to make salat. And so we have and the larger cities established uh, the Juma services on Friday based on the swelling of the membership of the local mosques. We have not established Juma here just yet, um, but inshallah, as we grow and as we develop um, and we get more believers that have uh, and are willing to make the sacrifice to be available on those Fridays, we are, we are, we are, uh, uh, we have believers who uh, have been well trained to uh, be khatib and to provide uh, the Juma services. And so, but the Saturday school, you ask the question like, what does that look like? Um, if any of us that have been in, in the school systems around the country, um, we have to understand that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan did a lecture one time entitled Education is the Key. And in that lecture, he mentioned that, I'm uh, not quoting, but he mentioned that we should be taught and developed according to what we were created and who we were created to be. We don't see that in the public school system. What we are being taught in mass in the public school system is how to become a better worker how to become someone who can be more productive for the corporate interest uh, and the capitalist interest of this great nation, whether it be through uh, private or through public uh, corporations or agencies, 
And so we were able to organize the children at that time period a few years back. Um, and we had several instructors that they would not teach uh, math unless it dealt directly with our teachings. They didn't teach American history or U.S. history. They didn't teach um, uh, grammar or reading directly. They taught the Holy Quran. They taught um, Arabic. They taught the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to our children so that they could be able to function. It's not enough for our children to go to Juma on Friday, a study session on Friday evening, and then to our services or to Talim service on Sundays and think that that's going to be enough in this great society with the great pool and the magnetational uh, pool of Satan in this world and think that they're going to be okay. And so what we were able to do by the grace of Allah is we got a few instructors together and we, we uh, one of our, the directress uh, at that time period, Sister Fudia, uh, my wife, uh, put together a curriculum for those students that they would be able to study what we were studying as adults. And really, to be quite honest with you, at this time period, knowing a few of those students that graduated from there, they know more sometimes than many of the adults who joined the Nation of Islam as adults and began the process of studying the Holy Quran and other aspects of the teachings of Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So that program was like a brush of fresh air because as you know, the target for the satanic machinations of this world are the youth. Because when you look at most of the prophets, they recognize their prophethood when they were still young. And so, but if um, they can be captured at a young age, then that extends Satan's magnet, magnetizing pull and that extends his rulership on our planet. And so, um, but yes, we work um, every day. Many of us are entrepreneurs. We have a, a family, um, our brother, Brother Reginald, Sister Christina, they've established a restaurant, a, a vegetarian restaurant in the city of Taylor. There are, are some uh, entrepreneurs in our mosque, some, uh, we have many educators in our mosque. We have, um, uh, you know, uh, we run the gamut of success in human endeavor and we encourage those uh, members of our mosque to, to think outside the box, pool their resources, and establish something um, that will help the onward march of Islam uh, and our community here in the city of Austin. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, uh, Robert. And it sounds like, you know, there's a this strong emphasis, not just, as you mentioned, I think on the slide there, of uh, this involvement as a productive person within society, but at the same time having a strong foundation with respect to faith, uh, but being an uh, intentionally engaged person, but having that uh, that foundation versus just being like a cog in the machine, um, you, you've got a purpose um, in that sense. Absolutely, yeah. my brother. Absolutely. Um, I get the, so the question came up here. This kind of relates more to, I think, to uh, kind of like the, the foundational aspect of the Nation of Islam with respect to uh, teachings and, and the religious aspect of it. Um, the question came of, uh, with respect to the uh, kind of wider Sunni Shia community, uh, you see kind of like this aspect of uh, madhabs or schools of law or jurisprudence, um, you know, kind of interpreting the Islamic tradition of the Sunnah or the Quran and making like legal rulings about it. Like, hey, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. Um, for the Nation of Islam, I think you alluded to this Um it does uh, the Nation of Islam follow a particular kind of, or maybe align closely with one of these kinds of school of thoughts, or is it more so with respect to um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's uh, teachings and interpretations? And I think uh, just as a tangent to that question as well, uh, is there a particular translation of the Quran that is preferred by the Nation of Islam or utilized um, in teaching or in use within uh, the community? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, 
suggested to the believers to utilize the Balada Muhammad Ali and the Yusuf Ali translation because of the simplicity of the English. Um, but he also encouraged us to learn the Arabic. But because we barely knew and barely know English, he asked for us and he prescribed those translations of the Holy Quran because of the simplicity of the English. Um, many people that have looked at our practices from other schools of thought, uh, from the Shiite community and other, um, they make various comparisons. But as you and I both know that these uh, schools of thoughts, these labels did not come from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they came after Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad talked about the establishment of one nation, a nation of Islam. But of course, as you mentioned, the schools of law and the schools of thought, you know, and those that interpret, um, we have uh, what has been established for our nation is a national assure council um, that is comprised of uh uh, attorneys that are comprised of ministers that are comprised of researchers and we we um, to help to guide us and to guide our practice under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and that council is is helping to keep our practice intact um, but there are some things that we have grown and developed as many may or may not know, we used to, as a community, practice Ramadan during the month of December. And many people um, threw stones at us because they would say that that is not what the prophet prescribed. And But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad reminded us that the Muslim community during the days of Prophet Muhammad and the establishment of Islam was taking uh, taken by stage, stage after stage. And so when he taught prayer, he didn't immediately teach uh, salat or prostration. He had to teach the early followers not to go to prayer intoxicated. And so, um, you know, it prescribed for us if you are sick or on a journey that you can fast a like number of days. So during the early days, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because we were not used to fasting, he said that we qualify as a community of people as being sick and on a journey from be, becoming Negroes and former slaves to becoming Muslims. So we took the month with the shortest days, which was December, to fast that like number of days. But since that time period, by the grace of Almighty God, Allah, we have matured in our understanding. We have matured in discipline. And so we unite with the Muslim world to, um, uh, to take part in the holy month of Ramadan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Brother Robert. I think yes, there's sir. a lot of power in that um, and, and, and that approach. You know, I do some work uh, in the local prison system and working with uh, brothers that are coming to Islam and uh, just thinking about from the backgrounds they're coming from, the communities they're coming from, the spaces that they're coming from. Thinking about uh, just how this this type of approach is. It's a, you know they 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 they've just learned how to uh, are just learning about some of these practices and um, in in a sense of how to meet them where they are versus like hey man what's uh, what's Islam and here's a bunch of books go read it you know for for, for folks having different starting points. So I appreciate you lifting that up of of being uh, cognizant of the condition of a community, a condition of a people, um, and to be able to tie those uh, those concepts together as was done. Um, the, the I think it segues into this next question um, uh, very nicely that uh, is there currently, you alluded to, you know, a, uh, a thriving kind of this history of, of so many different uh, endeavors and initiatives within the nation and the nation's history. Like, you know, you mentioned the, the fishing import business, you mentioned businesses of coffee shops of, uh, you know, um, you know, so many different kinds of uh, businesses that were across the country and whatnot uh, in the history of the nation. Uh, the question is, is there currently a presence of businesses in the communities of the nation of Islam uh, at the same level as was present in the 50s and 60s as a result of the historical do for self ethic? There are, um, particularly in the largest cities, 
uh, but I don't want to be remiss um, in my duty and my responsibility. We have some believers who have established um, a farm of, of sorts here um, in the Central Texas area, um, and and they're working tirelessly to engage in agriculture and farming and producing eggs uh, from chickens. They have uh, uh, several um, uh, <laughs> several horses, several cows, um, goats um, on a hundred acres of land, and they're consistently building and they're looking and they have a, they're establishing and they're in the the uh, planning stages of, of establishing a homestead and even a city um, here in, in Central Texas. But yes, sir, there are um, uh, believers that are taking uh, it up on themselves to hone their skills and their entrepreneurial uh, acumen, their business acumen um, around the country. Um, but you will see it more prevalent in the larger cities um, you'll see the schools, you'll see the mosque established first, you'll see the schools, you'll see restaurants, uh, you'll see clothing shops, you'll see those things. But for those who want to get more information about, um, if you live in the Central Texas area or the Austin area, you can go to our website, which is noiaustin.org. It's www.noiaustin.org. And you can get more information you can contact us, you can send us a message, and we'll respond to uh, uh, your message. So anybody looking for more information about the local activities here, um, you can also uh, visit uh, one of the, the establishments um, in, in Taylor, a Seed to Soul Food restaurant. In Taylor, you can look it up um, uh, there and you can go get a wholesome meal you can also come and visit us at our larger meeting on Sundays at 5800 Palmer, East Palmer uh, Lane uh, if you want to hear more about the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at 10 a.m. every single Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just drop the link in there for, for folks uh, so, uh, so you are able to connect and access. I know there's a question that had come up about uh, where um, you know the mosque is located. So 5800 East Palmer Lane, um, 10 a.m. on Sundays, inshallah. Um, yeah, and 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 you know, there's a there's, there's a couple other questions here. We'll we'll try and get through real quick, um, just for the sake of time. But uh, you know, uh, Sister Malika lifts up that you know, what is the pro uh, procedure for joining the Nation of Islam? Um, she says that you know, my mom tells me a funny story from her background uh, of having to submit a letter to be accepted into the Nation. Is that still the same process today, or has it changed? Yes, sir, that's still the same process. You come to any of our public meetings and um, it, it is akin to taking the Shahada, you join at the end of the meeting and then there is a process because the Nation of Islam is not just a place where you're given a Holy Quran and you're given a, a Kufi or, um, you're, and you're taught how to pray, but because of the condition of our people here in the United States of America, we have to engage in study. So when you join the Nation of Islam, you are entered into a class and that class orientates you and processes you into the body of knowledge of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And um, we make sure that you have a firm foundation so that, um, People don't have to ask you if you are a Muslim. They can look at your activity, they can look at your character, and they can denote based on that um, that you are a Muslim because a pair of lips, of course, will say anything. But I know what you believe by what you do. But yes, during that class, that processing class, you are uh, asked to write a letter asking for a holy name and admittance into the nation of Islam. And because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the principal figure and the eternal leader of the nation of Islam, the letter that he wrote, we write the letter um, like he wrote it. So in this juncture of time in 2024, they have taken cursive writing out of the public school system. So there are some 
believers that come to us and they can't write in cursive. And so we teach them how to write in cursive so that they can write the letter and finish the process of becoming a registered member of the Nation of Islam. But it's, it's still that process in a, in a, in a bean shell, a nutshell. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing the the background to it as well. The, 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 yes, the, the, so beautiful. Um, uh, there's a question that was lifted up that you probably saw in, recently in the, in the news. Um, um, Mal, uh, speaking to a little bit of the, the the that concept where you're saying that in the history, not just of uh, the nation, but of so many um, you know black organizations during the '60s and afterwards, you had uh, you know J. Edgar Hoover and the Cointel Pro program infiltrate and try and sabotage uh, a lot of these organizations and. From what you're saying as well, like the Nation of Islam was not uh, exempt from that as well. Um, that that type of maliciousness and, and intent there. Uh, there's a um, a recent headline that came out that uh, Malcolm X's family actually announced a lawsuit against the CIA, the FBI, NYPD for uh, you know the wrongful death. I know that one thing you and I probably have talked about this in the past that uh, you know people oftentimes have that misconception about the nation or have that, uh, that's maybe the first thing that they think about is like, oh, you guys killed Malcolm or like, you know, they, they, they have, they have that kind of misinterpretation or kind of first encounter in that sense. Um, so I'm wondering what the relation with uh, the nation of Islam currently is with respect to, um, you know, brother Malcolm's family and maybe especially at this time where they are seeming to uh, be uh, launching this lawsuit um, against uh, you know, that organizations that have traditionally uh, and have historically sabotaged uh, organizations. Yes, like in the, in the 90s, um, the FBI came to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and they said that we have gotten word that there's a murder for hire plot and that one of the daughters of Brother Malcolm um, uh, has um uh, attempted to hire someone to assassinate you. They're talking to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's response, I want y'all to listen at what kind of man the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is. His response was he secured her an attorney because he understood that these same dirty tricks from the COINTELPRO uh, mindset, and we can find it in scripture dating all the way back to the beginning of time, they used a manufactured lie, of course, and they used the emotion of our brother's family to stir and to stoke the fire of passion to entrap that sister to say that she uh, was seeking the life of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, but he hired an attorney to defend her. And um, there's a lecture entitled A New Beginning where the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam actively engaged in uh, uniting with the Shabazz family and undoing uh, or dealing with the emotions and the burden. We've carried that burden since that time period, that even though those who were arrested maintain their innocence, even after they have been released, um, but we wear that burden because coming out of the COINTELPRO program, remember they were on the hunt for a Messiah that could unify and electrify the, the, the uh, Black nationalist movement. That mess messianic figure they were looking at they didn't have his name on there, but it's in fact the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So the goal is to continue to besmirch the name and the reputation of anybody that could fulfill that type of role and could magnetize the people to unite and to unify. At the Million Man March, there weren't just Muslims in that two million in the Nation of Islam. There were Christians, there were Jews, there were agnostics, there were people from all uh, over the uh, uh, the planet with many different ideologies, but because he called for the men of this great nation, black men to come and to unite. There is a book that if anybody wants to get information about uh, the, the study and research about Brother Malcolm, you can go to researchminister.com. And one of our brothers by the, as on our research team, Dimitri Muhammad wrote a book that is 
uh, steeped in research, uncovered research, documented research, and the name of the book is called "But Didn't You K Didn't You Kill Malcolm?" And go get that book. It is uh, it is filled with tons of documented research and information that absolutely exonerates the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the assassination of Brother Malcolm. Thanks so much for sharing that, Robert. Yeah, just drop that link in the chat for um, everyone here. Um, and I think we just got our last question, and we'll wrap it up after that. But uh, the question comes with respect to uh, you spoke to a little bit of this. Maybe maybe this might be it. But um, in 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 another sense, if not, um, what do you from your experience being uh, here in Austin, um, you know, having interacted with not just the Muslim community but also non-Muslim community, you know, everybody around, what has been maybe the biggest misconception or misconceptions uh, that you've seen um, about the nation of Islam, uh, whether here in Austin or just in general that people might have uh, about so, Some of the major misconceptions is that uh, we hate white people. We hate uh, homosexuals, uh, that we oppress women. That's a really big one, that we owe press women and that uh, women have to be uh, subordinate or they have to be uh, seen and not heard. Those are some major misconceptions. Of course, the assassination and the murder of Brother Malcolm. Um, some people see the Muslims and you see me in a suit today. We have many brothers and sisters that see us in our downtime. I had a brother I, I had known for maybe maybe 10 years. And I saw him um, at a closed meeting one time and he said, Brother Muhammad, I didn't even know you dressed like that. I, I had on a jogging suit, a sweat suit and some, and some athletics, you know, some tennis shoes and, and whatnot. He said, I didn't. So uh, that's, a, that's a misconception that we dress like this all the time. Like this is what, what you do 24 seven. Like I'm sitting up in my living room dressed like this watching television, right? And, um, and so those are some major misconceptions, but we are your brothers and your sisters. We love our people and we like to have fun. We're not just uptight, you know, they hear us um, talking about these so-called holidays that came from holy days and, you know, about Christmas and Valentine's Day and, 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 and the origin of Easter and all of these things. And they say, you Muslims are always trying to take the fun out of things. Well, we just can't have fun. Um, but we like to have fun, you know? We, we, we like to skate, we like to bowl, we like to play video games, we like to have righteous entertainment and righteous fun. And so um, when people realize that um, we are normal people, um, we just yield the truth like a double-edged sword and we fight oppression and we fight injustice wherever we see it, man, woman, or child. And so it's a misconception that we don't smile, that we, we are always ready to do security and those types of things. But um, we are normal people that have accepted this way of life and are doing our best to make Allah happy I mean, with, with us. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, for you, uh, you know, being, uh, I, I think uh, one person is just curious about, you know, um, we're, we're in Austin, you know, we're in a space where we have a lot of new faces, a lot of people coming by, yes, um, probably changed a lot, of, a lot, uh, you know, just in the last five, 10 years or so. But uh, just wanted to know a little bit about uh, your own practice, your own, uh, you know, being involved with uh, the local mosque and being the student minister there, um, you know, uh, what what has that kind of been like for you and, and, and you know, your journey with respect to being within the nation of Islam? Have you been in Austin your whole life? You know, how's how's this kind of been being here now in this time of change and so many different things, uh, so many different injustices, as you mentioned, coming to the forefront? Um, and, and what's that experience kind of been like for you and at the helm of uh, the nation of Islam uh, mosque? Um, I was born and raised um, here in this, I'm a native Austinite. And of course the city has changed tremendously um, over the past 20 years, it's accelerated. Um, but being the student minister here in the city of Austin is um, at times extremely challenging. Um, 
you know, the responsibility and the duty of the spiritual development of those um, that are part of the mosque and um, considering the condition of our people, considering what we're attempting to come out of this systemic uh, oppressive lifestyle, this systemic uh, oppressive existence in the United States of America, we suffer from a lot of trauma. And you know, the thing about it, my brother, is just you think about how difficult it is to be responsible for the spiritual development of black men and women in the mosque and those that are in the community at large. But beyond that, the greatest jihad is the battle within. It is the fight within, the development within. So you couple that which with attempting, and I say attempting to help our brothers and sisters to develop on a spiritual plane. Sometimes you're met with, with you know, happiness and it seems like we're being productive and other times you're met with sadness. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad described this job as the hardest job ever given to a man. And when you think about the millions of jobs that exist on the planet today and the billions that existed throughout the annals of history, he said doing what Prophet Muhammad did in the establishment of Islam during his time period, doing that with black people in America that have been all but destroyed um, as a people, he said that's the hardest job that has ever been given to a man. So every time you see a Muslim sister in the Nation of Islam, and every time you see a Muslim brother, when you see those brothers out with the Final Call newspaper, I implore you to be kind and courteous to those believers because as you know, as Muslims, that um, there is a, a, an attack on Islam day and night. Uh, but just think about this great nation and the racism that exists. And so if Muslims are despised and rejected, then just think that the black Muslims are the despised and rejected among the despised and rejected. Um, in this great place. And so um, it's not an easy job, um, but it is a worthwhile job. And when we say that prayer, that our prayer, our sacrifice, our life, and our death are all for Allah, the Lord of the world, Allah will call us to account on that and try us over and over throughout the years of our development. So, um, so but it is a job where the reward um, can only come from Almighty God, Allah, you know, and so um, it has its ups and it has its downs. And so, but we're grateful to Almighty God, Allah, for the opportunity to provide a service or to attempt to provide a service for our suffering people. I mean, I mean, and thank you for sticking it out in, in, in Austin and, and, you know, throughout all the changes and for being in this space and continuing that work through those ups and downs. Um, uh, we got one last question here. I think this will actually be a good one to close out on. Um, and then I'm, I'd love to just give you the last words. Is anything that you'd like to share with folks that uh, may not have had a chance to mention, but um, just how you lifts up that uh, given kind of what's been going on in the world right now, uh, especially in Gaza, especially in Palestine, uh, does the nation of Islam take a stance on the Palestinian cause or uh, is the nation primarily uh, mostly focused right now on domestic and community issues within the nation and I imagine around uh, the communities in which it's a part of? Very, 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 very good and timely question. And I will answer it like this. Go to NOI.org. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, spoke, I think, nearly three hours or a little, maybe a little over three hours on this past Sunday, dealing specifically with what is going on in the Muslim world. And any and every question that you may have about our position, not only our position, but how this conflict 
even got started and our position and our support in this whole thing. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan answers all of those questions. Go to NOI.org and you can replay that lecture and you should study the lecture. And the Honorable Louis Farrakhan gives some very detailed information and evidence on what caused this conflict and what direction this conflict is going and even the outcome of the conflict. So that's a very good question. And the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is the one that uh, is qualified to answer all of your questions regarding the conflict in the Muslim world, but particularly there in Gaza. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, thank you to uh, Jamal Muhammad for dropping the link. I think it's to that lecture, um, to that that keynote address. Um, and so inshallah, I will also have that available. So yes, definitely sir. check that out. Um, well, uh, Mr. Robert, I want to give you the last word. Uh, anything that you'd like to lift up um, for the folks here, folks might be watching this uh, down the line um, that may, may not have had a chance to lift up during the course of uh, our conversation today. But uh, is there anything that you would like to leave as uh, a parting uh, words of wisdom or anything uh, for our folks here um, as they go on, um, but now having a connection to and having uh, interacted with uh, and having a relationship with uh, a person here in uh, the Nation of Islam and, and someone uh, from the community. All I would say to all of us that are listening is that wherever we meet our suffering people, Muslim or not, be patient with one another. Let us exercise patience with our growth and our development. And let us have patience with ourselves. For we know that if Allah was to punish us for all of our sins, there would be none of us left on this planet. So as he has been beneficent and merciful to us, let us exercise some patience with one another and let us not be quick to anger and condemnation of one another. And those of us who um, are going to participate in this year's holy month of Ramadan, let us put our best foot forward and let's do our best to adhere and keep up with the reading and keep up with the fasting and ask Allah for the strength and the fortitude to make it through this holy month of Ramadan and full money back guarantee. When we get on the other side of the holy month of Ramadan, we'll have a greater sense of spiritual keenness and we'll have a better relationship with Almighty God, Allah, which will help to foster a better relationship with our brother and sister in our communities. So thank you, my brother, once again, for um, utilizing your platform to, um, as a platform to share ide different various ideologies, um, to share information. I'm grateful to Almighty God, Allah, for you, my brother, and I'm grateful to, um, the spirit that he has given you to be as open as you have always been since I've known you. And may Allah continue to bless you and your entire family. Assalamu alaikum. I mean, I mean, assalamu alaikum. And again, I like that my, full money back guarantee. I think I'm, I'm going to have to borrow that. Uh, but inshallah, may that be the, the case. And, and uh, you know, no, no better words to be able to close out on. i just let folks uh, here know. Inshallah, we'll have the recording up from uh, this conversation uh, shortly uh, after. And then as well, please do connect with uh, Brother Minister Robert, uh, as well as the community here in Austin. Again, at www.noiaustin.org um, and uh, get a chance to connect with these great folks. Um, and inshallah, we'll keep that conversation going. As one of my teachers taught me, uh, it's never a end to the conversation. It's just a pause to it, and we'll pick right. it up again. But uh, we look forward to, uh, to look forward to what the next chapter holds, Brother Robert. But bl blessings to you, to the community at Mosque 64, um, and a blessed uh, Ramadan to come there. But we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch, inshallah. Yes, sir. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam. Thank you, everybody, for coming. As-salamu alaykum.